Hi, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of cardiovascular drugs, and this is recording part three. The last drug I'd like to discuss in this section is digoxin. Digoxin is mostly used to manage supraventricular tachydysrhythmias. So we're talking about patients with atrial tachycardia, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate. Digoxin will slow conduction through the AV node, and therefore, even though they're their atria may be going very quickly, it will reduce conduction through the node and reduce the ventricular rate. We'll see increased parasympathetic nervous system activity, um, which decreases SA node activity, and there is some risk of ventricular fibrillation with this drug. Now, digoxin was originally used for congestive heart failure, and it's an ionotropic agent, but it's no longer a first-line therapy. So if you see a patient who's taking digoxin, they're probably not taking it for heart failure anymore, rather for rate control of some supraventricular arrhythmia. Uh, the way digoxin works is by inhibiting the sodium-potassium ATP transport system in the heart, so you get increased intracellular sodium, which increases intracellular calcium, and thus increases contractility. Digoxin is renally cleared, and it's about 25% protein bound. Now, the important thing you want to know about digoxin is that it has a very, very narrow therapeutic range. In fact, at about 35% of the fatal dose, that's where we're trying to target patients for their therapeutic dose. So you can see we're walking a very fine line. The therapeutic range is, let's say, somewhere between 0.5 to 2.5, with the toxic range above 3. Patients will lose potassium. Um, rather, patients who lose potassium, like from diuretics or from alkalosis, are at increased risk for digoxin toxicity. Symptoms of toxicity include nausea, vomiting, vision changes, and some dysrhythmias. This is a picture of sunflowers by Van Gogh, and some people think that his yellow period may have been a manifestation of digoxin toxicity. If patients have digoxin toxicity, the first thing to identify is why. Are they hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic, hypercalcemic? Treat the dysrhythmias with an appropriate um, antiarrhythmic, whether it's phenytoin or lidocaine or atropine, they may need to be paced if they have complete heart block, and they actually have something called fab fragments, which is um, digitalis antibodies, and so you could administer those and they will bind up the um, excess digoxin. Digoxin can also interact with other drugs like quinidine, which will displace the digoxin from its tissue binding sites. Um, and some sympathomimetics could precipitate dysrhythmias, which is a good time to just remind you that um, all antiarrhythmic drugs have the ability to cause arrhythmias as well. Now we're going to talk about antiarrhythmic drugs. They come in a number of classes. The class one drugs are really the sodium channel blockers, and they are there are many of them. Some that you might be familiar with include lidocaine, phenytoin, and procainamide. Like I said, they block the sodium channel, and they decrease the rate that myocardial cells depolarize and the conduction velocity. Lidocaine is something you may especially want to use for ventricular tachycardia or if a patient is having a lot of PVCs. The ideal dose is 2 milligrams per kilogram IV. You can then run an infusion at anywhere from 1 to 4 milligrams per minute or a milligram per kilogram per hour, I believe. Um, it's metabolized in the liver. And as we already know, at high doses, lidocaine can cause CNS toxicity like depression, apnea, and even seizures. This will be worse during hypoxia or acidosis because of the increased transfer across cell membranes. Class II antiarrhythmic drugs are the beta blockers, and we've discussed those at length in prior recordings. The class III antiarrhythmic drugs include amiodarone, sodalol, rutilium. These are potassium channel blockers, which prolong cardiac depolarization and the duration of action potentials. They decrease the proportion of the cardiac cycle where the myocardium is excitable. Amiodarone is the class three drug you're most likely to encounter. Amiodarone is sort of a utility player. It actually prolongs refractory period in all cardiac tissues, which means it has class one, class two, even some class four effects. And so we see amiodarone used in the treatment of a wide variety of different arrhythmias, including supraventricular tachycardia, PVCs, VTAC, VFib, and we see it on the ACLS guidelines. It may also have some effect on the conversion of atrial fibrillation, which means most of the time when we treat atrial fibrillation, we're really primarily interested in rate control and just keeping the heart rate below 100. Amiodarone does that as well, 
but it may also have some effect on conversion of rhythm control, that is, getting them out of atrial fibrillation altogether. When patients are having a non-life-threatening tachydysrhythmia, the goal is to get 1,000 milligrams into the patient over 24 hours. So we give 150 milligrams as a slow IV bolus, usually over about 10 minutes. Then we give another 360 milligrams over six hours, so that's a one milligram per minute infusion. Then we cut it in half for the next 18 hours, and that should add up to about 1,000 milligrams. Compare that with pulseless VFib or VTAC, so this is a code situation, where we give 300 milligrams as an IV bolus. <clears throat> Amiodarone has a very long elimination halftime of, uh, of about 29 days and a very large volume of distribution. It's extensively protein bound, so it really hangs around in the body for quite some time. Common side effects that you should be aware of include lung injury, specifically pneumonitis. Patients do become hypotensive due to the vasodilation. They can develop photosensitivity and a rash, and they can also have thyroid changes due to the high iodine contact content. That's why it's called amiodarone. You can see the iota, which stands for the iodine in the drug. The last drug we're going to talk about in this recording is adenosine. And I put that next to amiodarone because people tend to confuse them a lot on exams. So I want to point that out to you right now. Adenosine, first of all, is a normal endogenous substance that your body makes. It's a nucleoside, and it's a very potent vasodilator, especially a coronary dilator. It also decreases your myocardial, myocardial oxygen consumption. It's remarkably short-lived, just about 0.6 to 1.5 seconds in length. Adenosine will stimulate your supraventricular potassium channels. It will hyperpolarize them, decrease the depolarization, and these uh, channels aren't in the ventricular myocyte. So this is really working above the level of the um, AV node. We use adenosine for a few different things. First of all, if someone is in some sort of a tachyarrhythmia, you could use adenosine to identify it. That is, you get rid of conduction through the node, and you can see what's happening just in the, um, in the atria. <clears throat> we can also use it to treat supraventricular tachycardias, like re-entrant tachycardias or atrial tachycardia, we can give this dose of adenosine and it will block the re-entrant cycle. Usually we start with a six milligram IV bolus and a repeat dose might be 12 milligrams. When we give adenosine, we see transient heart block or brief ventricular asystole. And this EKG over here shows a patient with SVT and then they got adenosine through a couple quick PVCs, I think. And then basically they have silence for several seconds. And then when it comes back, they are in sinus rhythm. Now, adenosine will not work to treat things like atrial fibrillation or flutter, and if you give it, what you will see is the ventricular response will go, and all you'll see is the atrial component. So you'll see the flutter waves or the fibrillation waves without any ventricular, uh, ventricular beats sort of blocking the image on the EKG. So it might be useful diagnostically, but it's not going to treat atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. Uh, it also won't treat ventricular tachycardia. Again, adenosine works above the level of the, at the AV node and above. Patients who have heart block or sick sinus syndrome, uh, you should be careful with this drug and preferably have an external pacer available in case they um, don't recover from this uh, ventricular asystole. So once more, if patients have regular narrow complex supraventricular tachycardia, then adenosine is a great drug to use. In fact, it's even appropriate as an emergency alternative to um, synchronized cardioversion. Now, if patients have some sort of anterograde accessory pathway, then this wouldn't be appropriate. So we would avoid adenosine in patients who are irregular or who have wide complex SVT, which might be a sign that there's some sort of an anterograde pathway. When patients get adenosine, they may have flushing or dyspnea. Um, this is due to the vasodilation that they experience. Same with chest pain. They may have some bronchospasm and a funny taste in their mouth, like a metallic taste. You may see adenosine being used as an infusion for controlled hypotension, although I've never done it in the operating room. We could also use it to create temporary asystole on purpose. So for example, if a surgeon is trying to clip a difficult aneurysm or deploy a heart valve in just the right spot, uh, it may be helpful to have the heart stop beating for a couple seconds, and adenosine can accomplish that goal. 
We also see adenosine being used in pharmacologic stress testing. Again, because of its vasodilation, it can cause a coronary steel syndrome and help highlight areas of the heart that are um, ischemic. We'll stop here and pick up again with the next recording.